Jess. Um, I hope you guys can all see me okay. So I'm Jen Gosterman. I'm a fourth year graduate student here at Harvard in the Earth and Planetary Science Department. And I study sea level change. And the kind of sea level change that I study is not so much what's going on today, but much more what happened in the past. Um, and I'll talk about that a lot today and tell you about why it's important what happened in the past we want to understand what's happening now and what will happen in the future. So to start off, I just want to motivate why we're interested in sea level change. And so I'm showing you here a map of Boston. You might recognize it. And everything that's in you know, the pinkish color is at within two to four feet of the sea surface. Um, and everything, that, everything that's colored in general is within six feet of sea level. And so as you see, a lot of the land in Boston is actually very close to sea level. And we're very interested in knowing how much sea level is changing um, in the near future, but also in the distant future, um, to know how we can mitigate or how we can adapt to these changes in sea level. More generally, though, um, if we think about sea level rise, we often think about a gradual rise in sea level. But actually, another important aspect of um, sea level rise it's related to storms and storm surges. So all these pictures are here are related to storms, storm event events, and some uh, related to Sandy here, the blackout in New York, Manhattan, and then this guy here standing in front of his house with the orange line marks the flood height to which um, his house gets flooded at a very high sea level um, at the same time as storms occur. And so. Um, I'll be talking about uh, millimeter changes, centimeter changes um, of sea level, and as such, that might not be as much. But if you add that to a storm, it might just be enough to bring water into your house um, or raise it just about a critical threshold where it actually can cause a lot of damage. So, how much is sea level changing? Um, what I'm showing you here is on the left are two plots of how sea level is changing with time. Um, on the x-axis here, we have the years starting in 1900 to 2000. Um, and this one here is for Boston, and this one here is for a site in Canada. And if you look at different sites in Canada and out along the U.S. and down to Puerto Rico, we see that sea level is changing, but it's actually changing by very different rates. And in some parts here, for example in Canada, sea level is actually rising um, dramatically. And Hmm? Oh, sorry. Thank you. You're paying attention. <laughs> so yeah, sea level is falling here in Canada and rising um, here at different rates along the U.S. And I will talk a lot about the spatial variability and how we can explain it and how we can actually use it to make predictions of where sea level, the sea level rise is coming from. Okay, so this is just kind of a brief motivation and introduction. So. Um, the outline of my talk tonight is I want to start by talking about sea level in general and what are mechanisms for sea level change. And in particular, I'm going to focus on one process um, which causes a lot of the spatial variability, and that process is called, called post-spatial rebound. Um, then I will talk about present-day sea level change um, and how we can, measure, can use measures of sea level change to actually predict um, how it's changing globally and how much ice is melting and talk about the specific contributions and the specific numbers. And then um, at the end, I'm going to move kind of to the future, but also to the past. And I'll be talking about times at the Earth's history where climate was warmer than it is currently, potentially, and talk about how the Earth has behaved in a warmer world and might be behaving in a future warmer world. OK, so I'm going to start with uh, mechanisms. And more generally, I'm going to start with the most basic thing, um, I'm going to just have to define what I mean when I have to talk about sea level. So on Earth, you can define two surfaces. One is the sea surface height here. So that's kind of the height at, what, at which the ocean surface lies. And even though you think of it in terms of where it is in the oceans, that surface can actually be extended into the continents. So if you were to like dig a little trench into the continents, where that um, surface, where that uh, water would flow, that's where the surface, the sea surface height goes. So it's defined everywhere, 
Then the other surface is the position of the solid surface, so that's what you're standing on. Topography is defined as the difference between the two. So if you have a little, if you're standing on this little island, your topography here is 10 meters. And your sea level is just the negative of that. So the sea level here at that position would be minus 10 meters. Likewise, if you're looking at an example in the oceans, this guy down here diving, looking at cars maybe, um, he's at minus 20 meters topography, but plus 10 meters sea level. So uh, topography changes and sea level changes are inherently linked. And that will come up a lot of, uh, during the talk as well. And I will talk about uplift being associated with the sea level fall, for example. So topography <laughs> going up is equivalent to sea level going down. Another important um, aspect of one of the things that I will talk about today is the distinction between local sea level and eustatic sea level. Eustatic sea level or global mean sea level. So what those two things are, so local sea level is just that person standing at one point here. So it's sea level at every point, and it's local sea level is defined, defined on each point on the earth. The eustatic sea level is the average sea level over the oceans. You might wonder why, why we make this distinction. I'm going to demonstrate this to you now with what is called a bathtub model. So if you think about a bathtub, it's a rigid container. What happens if we pour some water in there? Well, if we pour water in it, we see a change in local sea level. So you, if you have a little rubber, rubber duck swimming in the bathtub, it's going to come up by, say, 10 centimeters. The eustatic sea level changed, so the average over the whole bathtub would also increase by 10 centimeters, right? Because it's a rigid body, it doesn't deform, so whatever you put, whatever water you put at one um, spot is going to distribute, so that's equally um, rising sea level and we work in the same way. And so the analogy is, of course, that the, the world's oceans are like a bathtub. And so if they were, and if all of that, the earth was just rigid and fixed, if we add water to it, and of course now if I'm talking to you about water, if we um, add ice or melted ice to it, um, we would see the same sea level rise here as we would see here, as we would see it everywhere else. And so the eustatic or global mean sea level change is related to you know, the volume of water that I'm adding to the system. Okay, that's the bathtub model. And now we are going beyond that, and we're asking the question, okay, what happens if this isn't a, that the Earth isn't a rigid body, but rather you have uplift or parts of the Earth coming up? And then we'll talk about why this is and why this could be in just a minute. So what this guy over here says is, well, sea level is rising, because you still add water to the system, so locally here this guy sees the sea level rise, while this guy over here says, oh no, sea level is falling. Um, because he's going up faster than the sea level is rising. And so in this case, the change in the local sea level is not necessarily the change in the static sea level. And the reason that's important is because what we measure, so if we have tight gauges or different measures at location at cities in Boston, for example, where we measure sea level over tens of years, and what we measure is always the local sea level, but what we are interested in is often the eustatic part. So the global average, um, which is equivalent to how much ice is melting, this is the number you would see in the news, for example, that people talk about. And so it's important to understand um, that those two are not necessarily the same. Okay, so now we'll move on now to talking about mechanisms of how you can, see up, can change sea level, how you can change it statically, um, so by increasing the volume different mechanisms and how you can change it non-eustatically so the volume of the water in the ocean stays the same but locally um, you cause sea level change. <coughs> and I'm going to start with the first one. And so the eustatic sea level change that most people probably think about um, is related to ice melt. And so I'm showing you here just an example from Greenland. You see this little tongue going out into the the oceans here, this is kind of blown up, and you see, and you've probably seen this at some point or the other, a retreat of a glacier 
2010. So it's been retreated inland. And so additional um, water and additional ice has been added to the oceans, so you increase the aesthetic sea level. So you increase the volume of um, the water in the oceans. Another effect that is maybe not as often being talked about, but is becoming more and more important, is thermal expansion. And so if you ever had a glass, a water glass, and poured a hot liquid in it, and it cracked, the reason why it cracked is because of thermal expansion. Materials tend to expand when they get hot. And so they can't really fit into that rigid pot shape anymore, and so they want to make, make more space, and so it cracks along some form of weakness. And so the same thing happens with water. So if the water heats up um, because ocean temperatures increase, it, the water expands. And ex the expanding water leads to a global sea level rise, or I used to sea level rise. Um, and the last aspect of what can change the aesthetic sea level that I'm going to talk about here is um, land water contributions. And what that means is you have an, your ocean is a big reservoir of water, but you have also have water on land, right? So that's an, another um, part where, uh, where water is stored. Um, and you tra can transport water from the oceans on land if you evaporate it over the oceans and drain it off over the continents, for example. If you then start damming it at a lot of locations, you inhibit it from flowing back into the oceans. And so you're changing the budget of the um, water in the oceans. Likewise, if you take additional water out of the ground um, and use it, and then it gets pumped into rivers or whatever, it flows back into the oceans, you're adding um, additional water to the oceans. There's another way of Changing the volume of um, the water in the oceans is by just changing the budget between land water and ocean water. So those are the three main contributors to steady sea level change. And I will talk about what the different contributions are um, a little bit later in the talk. Then there are also mechanisms that cause a non-eustatic sea level change. That means it doesn't change the volume of the um, uh, water in the oceans, but locally you see a sea level change. So, some there are many effects. Um, I listed a couple here. But so, those are kind of localized effects. For example, um, coming back to the groundwater, so if you're taking the groundwater out and adding it to the oceans, that's fine, that's a static change. But then what actually happens subsequently is that the earth starts compacting because you take material out of it, right? And so this compaction uh, leads to local subsidence. So your land is going down, and what that means is you're seeing a sea level rise. And this is actually an issue that they're having in California, so all um, where you have these patches and dots are all places where you see subsidence associated with groundwater. Um, other examples of very localized uh, changes in your topography is, for example, delta subsidence. So um, New Orleans and the Mississippi Delta. Uh, delta is where the, a river hits the ocean and dumps a lot of the sediments. And what happens over time is that these sediments compact, just very similar to this example. And compaction, again, leads to a local subsidence, hence sea level rise. Or as a last um, example, uh, a local sea level change, tectonic activity. So in Japan, when they had that big earthquake, what happens is that you actually you're thrusting land up on that uh, on a fault, and so again, upward motion is a, any sort of vertical motion is always associated with a local change in sea level. So these are very localized effects, um, and all of these don't actually change how much water is in the ocean. But you can also have um, effects that don't change the water in the oceans, but are global on scale. And I'm going to talk about two examples. One is related to ocean currents. So I mentioned before that you have that sea surface height, right? That's where the ocean lies on. But it actually doesn't quite. And the reason that is, is because of winds and currents. So if you're thinking of your water glass, again, and if you're kind of like, blowing over it, what you see is that the surface of the water kind of tilts a little bit, right? 
And so a similar thing happens in the world's oceans. Because you have wind and, and ocean currents, your sea surface is a little tilted towards where it actually would be if it wasn't, if it wasn't moving. Um, and so these, what I'm showing you here is by how much that is currently um, tilted. And so the scale here, we're looking at plus minus a meter and a half. And so if anything in the, in the current changes or in the wind pattern changes, we can change um, this pattern. And hence, again, locally, you could see a change in zero. So you see that we already talked about a lot of effect, the effects that cause the level change. Um, and this is going to be the last one here. Um, and that's uh, the one's called post glacial rebound. And I will talk uh, in more detail about this after the first question, right? But just to um, give you a first idea of what that means is if you have a large ice sheet here, for example, um, and it sits on the earth, so the lithosphere is just a layer, an upper layer of the earth's mantle, of the earth's interior, and then if you go a little further down, there's the earth's mantle. So if you throw a big ice sheet, what it does, it depresses the earth. Um, then you melt all that ice. Um, and then, again, ice melts related to a eustatic change. But even after all that ice has melted and the eustatic change is zero and nothing is being added to the system anymore, what you see is the Earth is still kind of slowly adjusting to where the ice used to be. Um, so that is kind of rebounding, hence post-glacial rebound. So the Earth is coming up. And again, you have a topography ch change, hence you have a sea level change. Um, associated with Okay, so just kind of to wrap this up before we have a first quick question break. Um, I talked about different mechanisms for aesthetic sea level change and uh, mechanisms for local sea level change. And all these effects that don't actually cause aesthetic change and just the local change, these are kind of, in a way, contaminations that we want to subtract out so that we can to get what we're actually interested in, which is the amount of ice volume changes or the amount of thermal expansion. Okay, and with that, I'm going to have a uh, first question. Uh, yeah. You mentioned thermal expansion, but doesn't ice do the opposite of thermal expansion? When the ice melts, you have less, you have less volume of water than when it was ice? Um, yeah, that's true. So if you melt the ice, the, that amount, that ice parcel is going to change from a solid into a liquid and it's going to change the volume and it's cold. But on average, if you look at the temperature change in the oceans everywhere with time, it's increasing. So you have parts where you add melt, melt water that are pretty cool, but on average it's increasing. Okay, so if you have a large ice sheet that's not on top of land but is on top of the ocean and that melts, what's that? Right. What's that, what that going to do? Yeah, so that actually doesn't do anything. So if you have an, uh, an ice sheet that's already in the oceans and you melt that, you're not adding the volume of that material in the oceans, right? And so you see no eustatic sea level change. Uh, I looked at the map of the ocean high around the world and I noticed it was uh, dark, which I think means lower near Antarctica and mm -hmm. somewhat high areas seem to be somewhat more weak layer. Does that have anything to do with the rotation of the earth and the equatorial folds and you get more of that in water than you do in rock? Yeah, um, so I'm pretty sure not. So these, when I talk about the sea surface relative to its equilibrium surface, right, which is what I was showing on the plot, that equilibrium surface already accounts for the rotational um, the rotational effects. Otherwise, that would be much larger. And I should probably know the number, but it's on a like meters of scale with the bulge. Yeah. Can you directly measure land elevation by way of uh, satellite GPS data bouncing signals off the moon or you know, some sort of thing like that? Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, so you mean changes in the land yeah. elevation? Yeah, rather than just measuring land relative to sea, you're directly measuring what the land is doing when you have those. Uh, you know, you know, pushing up Coming tectonic up. activity and stuff like that. Yeah, so there are different, um, there are different ways of measuring. I mean, it's always relative to something else, right? It always has either relative to how it was in the past, um, if you measure it at 
change in time, or if you measure it at one time, it has to be relative to, say, the, the sea surface. Um, so they are actually very good um, satellite data that look at not only elevation changes on land, but also in the oceans, <coughs> which is interesting for sea level change. Um, and what you can see that a lot is related to earthquakes. So before and after an earthquake, you can actually see dramatic changes in, in the elevation. Um, other than that, the changes are relative. I mean, we're still talking millimeters, maybe a little more. Um, it's kind of, you, I think you can also see it if it's not related to an earthquake, but it's, it's getting closer to the detection limit. But yeah, satellite data can be used to do that. Yeah. A follow-up on the uh, mm -hmm. map. Mm -hmm. I was thinking the, it's cold in Antarctica, mm -hmm. North Pole, and cold water contracts, and you're expanding uh, toward the equator. Is that... So, uh, so is that also accounted for, or is that what we're mostly seeing? Um, so, the th I mean, the, th the thermal expansion contribution that I've been talking about is kind of the average, so how much does the ocean on average warm? Um, and that accounts for if the north, if, so because the poles are cool, but they have, have been they have also, we are only interested in changes, right? So are they getting cooler or are they getting warmer this time? Um, and if temperatures increase, for example, in the, uh, in the North Pole, as they do, um, you do see, even though it's cold, the change is a positive trend. And so you do see that thermal expansion effect as well. Um, what, what, if, what are the specific reason for the sea level change for Churchill seem to be so specific. Good question. Yeah, okay, I think I'm just going to move on to the next section because I'm going to be talking about exactly that. And if you have more questions on, on that, I can um, I can talk about it in the next session. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about this effect post glacier rebound, which is related to that anomaly. And this guy here already gives you an indication of what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> because I'm going to talk a little bit about ice age cycles. So what I'm showing you here in this graph is on the x-axis <coughs> here is time in thousands of years. So the right here is present, and you're going back to 500,000 years ago. Those are pretty big time scales. And what you see sort of on the y-axis, I've sort of plotted here, is everything that plots up in the upper part of the, this graph um, means that it was a time where it was warmer and there was little ice around as today. And everything that plots down here was a time where it was very cold and there was a lot of ice around. And so we call these kind of peaks, like the one we're in right now, warm interglacial periods because they're in between glacials. And everything that plots down here we call glacial maxima. And we call these things ice age cycles because we're cycling from warm to cold, from warm to cold, from warm to cold periods. Excuse me. Yeah? The vertical axis, what, what are the values? Are we talking about temperature or talking about sea right. level? Or yeah, or so, so on the y axis, I'm not, I have a couple of slides, I can talk about this later if there's time. Um, this is a proxy that integrates temperature and sea level, but specifically what that means in terms of how much sea level was different is if we look at the uh, last glacier maximum, so 20,000 years ago, sea level was 130 meters lower than um, currently. And so there was a massive ice sheet here over Canada, and there was a very big ice sheet over Scandinavia, the ice sheet over the Antarctic was bigger as well. And so 130 meters, that's a lot. If you take 130 meters everywhere out of the oceans and put it onto the continents, it's, it's quite a lot of ice. So what does that do to the Earth when it forms and when it melts? So if we, so again, we're kind of looking at a cross section through the Earth. Um, and we have an upper layer of crust and a lower layer of the mantle. And so you form this ice sheet. And what happens is um, 
on long, even though the Earth is relatively solid, if you stress it for a long enough time period, it starts to deform and it starts to flow. And so what happens is that you have subsidence here because of that additional load. And you have bulging because you're depressing it, but at the same time you have still the same amount of mass, right? So it needs to go somewhere. So it, that extra mass flows into these bulges uh, at the edges. And what this compares to is we have like a balloon and you squeeze it a little bit. So it depresses where you put pressure in and it kind of bulges a little bit around that. And, um, and so this is my, <laughs> this is my um, advisor, Jeremy Chubica, and he is demonstrating this with a balloon that has the earth in it. <laughs> and I think he's actually pressing on uh, to demonstrate that. And so what happens when all of this ice melts is that, okay, first you melt all of that ice, and sea level rises by 130 meters. But then even after all that ice is gone, the Earth is still adjusting to um, that ice that was there before. So that adjustment time scale is relatively long, and longer than the melting time scale. And we can model this process um, of post-glacial rebound and the adjustment associated with that. And I'm showing you here, excuse me, um, I'm showing you here a numerical prediction of the sea level change, um, the present day, that is only due to this ongoing adjustment to the last ice age. And so there's no present ice melt, so there's no eustatic sea level change at this point in time, but we still see that sea level is changing everywhere. And it's changing significantly on the same order of the kind of values that we measure. So this is the millimeters per year. Yeah. And what you're seeing is where we had these big ice sheets. So it's over Canada, um, Scandinavia, and the Arctic. Uh, sea level is falling um, because the land is coming up. And, and so Churchill, Canada is right in there. And then these bulges that I was referring to, that kind of in the periphery, um, and that were high once when the ice depressed them the earth, are now coming back down. And so um, a subsidence, again, is, a, is related to a sea level rise. So we see a sea level rise associated, associated with that. And bringing it back to these numbers, you see that some of these trends here, so um, uh, the sea level, um, now, now I'm very conscious about sea level fall and sea level rise. <laughs> uh, the sea level fall here in Canada um, can be attributed to a big part to this effect. And some of these other patterns that we're seeing here can also be associated with effects of post glacial rebound. Okay, so now I'm kind of giving you a, uh, an understanding of all the, the mechanisms that go into sea level change. And I'm going to move on now to talk about how much sea level is actually changing and how we can use this understanding of the different, me different mechanisms to estimate how much sea level is changing. And so first, what you have to do is, so I'm going to lead you a step through how we actually get to the estimates that we have about sea level change. So first you measure local sea level, and this is, shows you where we have data. Um, some of them are a little shorter, 50, some of them are 100 year long, the red dots, um, some of them are much shorter, just a few years. So there's sparse locations, so at only a few locations um, and only the varying time um, periods of record. What we then do as the next step is we correct for the non eustatic sea level changes. So we want to know how much is actually the eustatic change. That means we have to take all the, correct all the uh, contaminating effects, so to say. Um, so we correct for any of the local land movement, ocean circulation changes, and for the post-glacial rebound effect. So if we've done that, what does the data look like? So once you've corrected for all these non eustatic sea level changes, do all the sites show the same value? Is that the eustatic sea level value that we're looking for? Almost, <laughs> but not quite. And the reason is kind of a blessing and a curse. So if you're only looking for the static rise, you're like disappointed because now the additional models you have to do. 
But there's a residual spatial variability, and that can actually tell us something about where the ice melt is coming from. And the reason why that is is kind of related to the effects of post-glacial rebound glacial ice static adjustment that I've been talking about. So in these post-glacial rebound calculations, I was I stressed in saying that there was melt that go there was ice that melted. And now we have ongoing adjustment, no current ice melting. So what about that no current ice melting? What about the ice that is melting currently? And what signal does that have on the deformation of the Earth? So if we have an ice sheet here, here what it does, actually, is it's a huge amount of mass, right? And so what it does is it pulls, it gravitationally pulls ocean water towards it. So it's a big mass, and mass attracts mass. When you um, melt this ice sheet, and here is the extreme event of the full ice sheet collapsing, but also if you just melt parts of it, like we do currently, um, what you see is that, that this gravitational pull is subsiding. And what this does, it, it leads to a very non-intuitive result, which is that sea level close to a melting ice sheet is falling. So what I'm, and, and, and this effect is called fingerprints and fingerprinting. So I'm showing you here on left and right, one for Greenland and one for the Western Arctic, how sea level is changing if I melt ice from Greenland, ice from the Western Arctic, and if I melt something that is equivalent to um, a eustatic sea level rise of one meter. So it's just normalized to a, a one meter value. And you can scale that up and down if it's a little less or a little more. Um, so just to demonstrate the effect, if I'm melting Greenland, and everything that's dark blue here means sea level is actually falling because I'm losing that gravitational effect, and so my sea surface height is actually going down. Well, it's everywhere in the far field, so far away from the light sheet, we actually see a sea level rise that's a little higher than the average one meter. So the same happens for the Western Arctic if that actually melts. Um, and so even though that's another process we have to model, it gives us the ability to estimate where ice is melting coming from. And so what we're doing is we assume that the thermal expansion component in the land water storage is a uniform weight. So we have all the data that's been corrected for local effects. Now we have a uniform contribution. Then we can we have a Greenland contribution from Greenland that has a specific spatial variability. We can see how much we have to add of that. And then we have melting from the Antarctic that has a specific spatial variability. And we can find out how much we have to weigh each of these contributions um, so that we actually get the best fit to the data. And when we've done that, we've actually teared apart all the different contributions to use static sea level change. We can add them back up again if we're interested in what the actual sea level change is, or we can look at them individually. And so here I'm showing you, and so this is actually all from our very recent nature paper that um, we worked on by Carlin Hay, who's a postdoc in, in my group. And I think I have a reference of that on the, uh, on my, on the handout. It's very technical, though. Um, but so what I'm showing you here is the eustatic sea level change, or global mean sea level change, um, from 1900 to 2000 um, over time. And so here we're looking at millimeters. So minus 10 is minus 10 centimeters. So centimeters changes be divided by 10. And so these are different predictions. And they actually updated the prediction to this blue line of how much sea level is changing over time. And so this is the eustatic sea level change. And what they come up with is that from 1900 to 1990, sea level has been rising by a millimeter to a millimeter and a half per year. And since 1993, it has been rising about, about double that, um, so about three millimeters per year. So that's an interesting finding in itself. But then we can also look at the different contributions. So here, in earlier times, we have mainly this dark blue, which are other mountain glaciers, which means not the Antarctic or Greenland. And then we have a contribution from Greenland. Since 1993 or so, um, we have a very significant contribution 
from thermal expansion that's related to temperature changes. And we have an increasing contribution from the Antarctic ice sheet. And so the Antarctic ice sheet is starting to melt as well. So just to recap that before we're going to head off to into the intermission. Um, so we can use the local sea level and our understanding of the different mechanisms to extract eustatic sea level changes and the different contributions. Sea level has been rising, or is rising now, by about 3 million meters per year. Um, and it has been accelerating, so this rise has been increasing over the past 100 years. And just to give you a preview, so after um, the intermission, what I'm going to be talking about is a little bit of the future and how well we can say about what happens um, after today. And with that, I'm going to break the intermission. And I think we can, if there are questions now, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I can also answer them. Just repeat the question for the live stream whenever somebody asks. Um, oh, okay, sure. Oh, yeah, so when, um, so at the end of these ice ages, mm -hmm. right, like if you have, uh, you know, 130 meters of sea level change, Yeah. I mean, what's the time scale for that? For that, um, for that so sea level rise, rise over that time? Yeah, for that um, rise. Yeah, let me actually go back. So the question was, what's the time scale of the sea level rise after a glacial maximum? Um, so if we look at that, you see that we actually see a shape, it's kind of like a sawtooth, which is what they refer to, because we have a very rapid deglaciation mm -hmm. uh, and a much slower kind of glaciation. Mm -hmm. And so the time scale, so this is 20,000 years ago, um, and the deglaciation stopped Around fifteen, uh, I'm sorry, around five thousand years ago. So you have one hundred and thirty meters in fifteen thousand years, which is very rapid, um, faster than what we see today. But today we are in a warm period, so we wouldn't expect it to see it. Yeah. And stay on that graph. Mm -hmm. it, it would seem logical to suggest that we're about to reach a peak and start dropping, just based on the historical record. Um, are we gonna go into so like? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, like, what what happens here? Are we going back into a uh, are we going back to an ice age, and does that counteract everything else? Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. So uh, it's probably still a few thousand years away. Um, <laughs> okay. But if uh, but it's very likely that so these are forced by kind of how far away and how the Earth is kind of located in its angle towards the sun, um, and. And this is these variations um, happen periodically. So we would expect that we're going into another ice age. But with the current war warming, we also don't know how that counteracts um, any new glaciation. Uh, I've heard that we're in a cold period, but I see now that that was mistaken. So yeah. Just so mm, yeah. So actually, technically, this whole uh, this whole period. And going back two and a half million years ago is called an ice age. And that's, I mean, that's just the terminology. Um, because there were actually times in the Earth's history where there was no ice around at all. And actually, most of the Earth's history, there was no ice around at all. So, relatively speaking, to um, all of the past of the Earth, we're in a cold period. But uh, relative to what's going on in the last 100,000 years, we're in a warm period. Yeah, and one more thing. When you model the isostatic rebounds, do you take into account the differences in how ductile uh, different earth materials like uh, basaltic oceanic crust versus continental crust and hot and cold areas of the earth's crust affects that? Uh, yeah, so the way that that's modeled is um, that we assume the earth is viscoelastic. So that means if you force it or if you stress it, there's a first kind of elastic response from like a spring, and then there's a slow, gradual response after that, which is the viscous part of it. Um, and so, in a sense, it's not ductile, but it, because it's the way you model, it's viscoelastic. Um, and in terms of the temperatures, so uh, what pe temperature would do to this, the way that we model it, is, is that, um, and I have to see that I get this right, but um, a higher temperature, <coughs> would reduce the viscosity 
So a higher temperature would make it to deform more easily. Um, and in most of the models, we assume that to a first order, the Earth only varies with depth. So, so the visco there's this parameter of viscosity only varies with depth. Um, and there are more sophisticated models where we actually look at how if there are lateral variations in this viscosity term, how that affects most glacial we learned as well. Okay, I think we'll have drinks and snacks. Okay, I'm gonna um, start back up with the with the talk. And um, this last part is kind of it's gonna be the light part with a lot of pictures. So you can mess. Um so what I alluded to just before the end of the break, and just before the break, is that now I'm going to talk about the future, and more specifically about how the Earth behaves in a warmer world. And one approach of predicting what the future does is um, to run climate models and see how, under different um, emissions and also CO2 emissions, how, how temperature changes and how um, sea level changes under different scenarios. And I'm showing you here. Um, so you have two scenarios, kind of, um, which kind of span the range from we, uh, emissions don't really increase at all to emissions are going to increase a lot. Um, and what you see in black with the, the gray uncertainty is how much sea level is going to, so again, the eustatic sea level is going to change over time. So here by um, the end of the 21st century, we see about 40. 40 centimeters, and compared to here, where we see about up to 80 centimeters. Um, and there are different contributions to that they model, and so the thermal expansion actually plays a very important role, and is directly linked, of course, to the temperature changes. It's very hard to model ice sheets into the future, but because it's the way that models are set up now, ice sheet models, is that they incorporate under our understanding of the physics of the ice sheet. Um, and we can test them compared to data from, say, the last 10 tens of years. Um, and we can choose parameters that best represent that behavior for the last tens of years. But maybe those last tens of years are not a good representation of what's going to happen to our temperatures in the future and don't actually capture a lot of the instabilities or behaviors of the um, ice sheet in the future. <coughs> So another way of asking the question of what, what does the Earth naturally do um, in a warmer world is to say, let's look at a time in the past, specifically, let's go to the last Olympic glacial and try to understand how were temperatures different, how was CO2 different, and how was sea level different during that time, um, in order to say, okay, how, how well do our, do our ice sheet models actually predict sea level changes during that time before set with a different temperature and a different CO2. And so I do mostly modeling work, but a couple of uh, months ago, they took me along on a field trip um, to Bermuda, and, and that was a lot of fun, <laughs> because most of the time we walk along the beach or along the coast um, at a very beautiful island. And what you're looking for are indicators that tell you where sea level was in the past. And I'm going to show you a couple of indicators that can be used. So one are corals. So here on the left, of course, I'm showing you a living coral. Um, and corals are good indicators of sea level because corals only grow within a very certain depth and certain, very certain range of the sea surface. So we then go into the field and see it's a little large sea. But, so this is a fossilized coral. So it's a coral that died and petrified. Um, and then here, this is part of a coral reef uh, that used to be alive and used to be around and used to look like this. Um, and so what we can say then is we can look at these locations and say, OK, sea level in the past was here a little bit higher than, than this point, for example, or a little bit higher than that one. And so it gives us an indication for where sea level was. Um, another way of uh, reconstructing where sea level was is looking at the stratigraphy. So it's kind of just a pile of rocks at first sight. 
But if you look a little closer, you see that there's some layering in this direction. And on top of it, you see kind of very flat beds. Uh, and the way that this kind of formation uh, forms is if you have just the beach here, and then if you start having a wind direction that blows sediments towards the ocean, what you start to see form here is just a little sliver. You see the sediments are going to get transported here, and they uh, sediment and uh, and petrify, and then you see they um, drop it drops off into the ocean, and it doesn't when once it reaches the ocean, the water mixes it around. And so if you keep bringing material here uh, um, onto the beach and into the ocean, you keep seeing these patterns of a shallow dip and then a very steep dip. And so these cement in place, and this can go on, and of course this only forms under certain conditions, and is only preserved under certain conditions, so you don't see this everywhere um, on every beach, but on some beaches you see it, and if you see it, it's a very good indication that at this boundary between the shallow beds and the steep uh, sloping beds, um, that there was the sea level at a specific point in time. The last indicator of sea level um, that I'm going to talk about are notches. So this is the present day, of course, um, the present day sea level. And what we see is that uh, there's actually erosion happening. So you have this wave, these waves that come in and they have a high energy and so they kind of eat away this rock and they form a notch. And if you look at the record, sometimes you see these notches very high up. In Bermuda, we actually didn't find any. And again, those have to be preserved. Um, but I'm showing you here an example from Barbados from the same time. So, so MIS-50 is just another word term for the last of the And you can see these very big notches. And you see them actually um, a lot around the Mediterranean as well. And they indicate that sea level was within this range at a certain point in time. OK, so you have found now the different um, indicators for sea level. The next step is you have to measure the elevation of them. And so the way that we did that here is this is like an antenna, a receiver up here, and essentially it's just a fancy GPS that doesn't just tell you the longitude and latitude, but also the elevation you're at and very good accuracy. Um, and then you also collect shells or fossilized pearls. And this is the first sample that I ever excavated, so I'm very happy there. Um, and then you send them off to the lab and they date it. Uh, and ideally, so here in Bermuda, for example, we already, uh, there, was a lot of, uh, there are a lot of papers published on the geology, so we were already relatively certain that what we're looking at is the last interglacial. But if you are, you can take um, these samples and to send them to the lab and they date them. Um, and they can tell you when these shells or these corals were alive. And that's kind of interesting too because, of course, anything that you take out or excavate, you have to document and, um, and to send to. There's a natural history museum that kind of monitors that. Um, because, for example, we went to one of the sites that were uh, documented in the li literature, um, and we didn't find the site because someone built that beach house on this part of the land. And so I destroyed all of the record, not knowing, of course. Um, and that's something that I actually became more aware of going on that trip, that a lot of the record from either us taking it out or people just not being aware of it, um, destroying it. And so there, people have gone all around, I had a question on how many data there are. Um, people have gone all around the world to look for uh, high stands during the last interglacial. And so these are all data points from where we have some sort of data, some better than others. Um, most people just use like a couple of these sites because they say those are robust. Um, but there are potentially a lot of different sites um, where we have data for where the sea level was in the last interglacial. And um, the common kind of agreement is that high, the high stand was about five to nine meters higher at the last interglacial relative to the present and that most melting came from Greenland and the Western Arctic ice sheet. There are still open questions about the timing, so did that, was an ice sheet collapse at the beginning of that interglacial period or at the end? Um, how much that did exactly come from Greenland versus the Western, Western Arctic? 
And then also, what exactly are the temperature and CO2, CO2 conditions if we want to com compare that to any future um, sea level rise. I would say that it's, the last minute glacier is probably not an analog for future sea level rise because we already know that um, the CO2 was significantly lower than what we had today. It was more like a pre-industrial value. Uh, and the temperatures might have been slightly elevated, but not, not, that, um, not um, significantly more. However, even though it's not, it's not that we can use that as saying, okay, this is the natural contribution to sea level change, we can use it to say, um, if we run our ice sheet models for that period of time, this is what we want to produce. And if we can't produce that, how, how good are our models if we want to um, project the, the, today into the future? And this is what people are actively working on. <coughs> okay, with this, I'm just going to summarize now and give you a little fun look. So I told you that I used to steady sea level is changing, and it's mainly changing due to thermal expansion and ice melt. Um, I also told you that local sea level is different from the aesthetic sea level, and that's something important to keep in mind, as well as um, a big contribution to that local variation is due to, due to post glacier rebound. And then I went on to tell you about current sea level change, and that that's about 3 million meters per year and rising. And lastly, um, I talked about past ice volume changes. And um, just want to emphasize again that not only understanding what the past did in, act, um, in an effort to say something about the future, but also to understand what the past did in order to, to constrain that post glacial rebound component. Um, it's very important to, to understand and to make sure we're modeling right what happened in the past if we want to say something about now and about the future. Okay, so now towards the outlook part. Um, part. I told you a lot about sea level changing. So what do we do about this? So a lot of the figures that I used for this are actually from the IPCC report. So this is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And those are, um, it's a panel of scientists who come together and um, write this report that kind of documents our current understanding of climate change. And it's mainly targeted um, for politicians that they can look at it and take those things into account when they make policy decisions. But it's also formulated in a relatively general sense so that anyone who's interested in the topic could look into it, look into it and educate themselves. So one way of uh, counteracting sea level change is by mitigating it, so not having it happen. Um, and so one way is to reduce CO2 emissions. And CO2 emissions would, if we reduce those, we keep the temperatures um, lower than they might be. Uh, and that would mean that we don't get as much sea level rise from thermal expansion, expansion as, a, as well as not as much sea level rise from ice melt. But sea level is already rising. So how can we adapt to what is already happening? And it was, kind of following up on this image that I had on my, one of the first slides, which is the blackout uh, in Manhattan. And one project that they started um, very recently, and part of the response to Sandy as well, is uh, called the Big U. And what it is, is essentially a wall <laughs> around Manhattan. Uh, and they presented it in a way that they said, okay, um, how can a wall be more than a wall? Because no one wants to have a the wall at the waterfront, right? So how can we make this a little more attractive? So if you have a wall here and you have the sea level, the other side, people over here. Um, and they come up with different concepts. So you can have a garden, or you can have seating arrangements and shelter, or you can have shops here. Um, and there are different ways of using it and integrating it into um, everyday life to make it pretty and nice. Um, and uh, this is a mock-up of them, one of the projects also where they say, okay, we can also use this for educational purposes um, or as museums, and here you see that their idea of having need sea level here and seeing how high it rose in the past or in the future, um, and I thought that was kind of cool. And with that, I uh, want to thank all of you for coming today.
Um, and I'm happy to, to stay around for questions if you have some or you can contact me later. Um, yeah, thanks so much. I think so. Uh, I mean, I don't know how. So that 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 project of funded, I don't know how it's actually gonna look in yeah. when they build it. But yeah, it's kind of Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, I do.